All right, Shalom. I want to praise to Yahweh by Shem, Yahweh Shah by Shem, and Kakadash. The one that said, Pastor Elders of Great Brimstone and Rule Well. Peace and salutations to you, sincere Akim. Push the truth across the four corners of the earth, the hopeful elect. Hey, uh, real quick, it's a you. And it's, it's crazy because you got so much history about um, slavery, the, the, the hardships, and the different evil things that these Edomites did, right? Willie Lynch uh, and different other Edomites, the different things they did to uh, mentally put an attack on us, put a spiritual attack on us, you know, them, the clan, all these different people. Now, you still have people riding with it. You still, well, most importantly, you have so-called our people, right, who are Israelites, black, Native American, and Latino people riding and siding with them, even though the past has been treacherous towards you. And uh, I just wanted to bring out, man, this is an important article to the Massachusetts Historical Society. This is Jonathan Edwards' Defense of Slavery. And, uh, you know, you could, you could read through it. I was kind of reading through it. And, uh, of course, it shows a picture of him. It's fucking devil with a fucking wig on. You know, he's an he's a Edomite. And you still got these so-called Calvinists, right? These so-called theologians, because he's like the forefather of theologians. And the forefather of theologians is a wicked man. So common sense should tell you, you know, this dude is wicked. This dude is completely fucking wicked. But, you know, we, we still have to bring out the facts. Uh, this particular document examines a lot of his uh, his works, a lot of things that he wrote, uh, you know, because these Edomites, they save all that. They save that and they archive it and they treat it as a... a, a, a a document of American history. It's an important part. You know, they preserve the paperwork for it. Uh, I'm just going to read an excerpt from this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's like 37 pages. Um, Okay, here we go. Here's the part I'm looking for. This says, uh, Edwards defended the traditional definition of slaves as those who were debt debtors, children of slaves, and war captives. captives. For him, the trade in slaves born in North America remained legitimate. However, here, however, Edwards' argument took an unexpected turn. He asserted that condemning slave owning while ignoring the overseas slave trade by which thousands were taken forcibly from Africa was to condone a far more cruel slavery than that which they object against in those that have slaves here. Therefore, he opposed full, excuse me, further incursions into Africa for new slaves, denying that nations have any power or business to disenfranchise all the nations of Africa. Uh, if they did, this constituted a greater encroachment on the liberties and even the opposers of this trade themselves do suppose this trade. Character characteristically, he crafted a stance that avoided what he saw as the excesses of the extremes. I right, see so he didn't want to necessarily destroy all of Africa. He just wanted to keep keep slavery how it was. If I'm reading that correctly, hold on. Okay, this is the part I'm looking for. So lock it. Uh, as with the right, he, he didn't he didn't want to continue with the slave trade, but he wanted the slaves that were there to stay slaves. That's basically what I'm saying. As with previous and later defenders and opponents of slavery, Edwards gathered scripture texts from both the Old and New Testaments to support his views. Certain texts undercut the Northfield Brethren's perspective and justify his own critique of the African slave trade. For example, he took exception to the narrow definition, definition of neighbor as in thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself 
as limited only to those of the same religion and in close proximity or to those identified typologically and racially as the new children of Israel, which these white men consider themselves the new children of Israel. Now with this particular scripture, um, pull it up, it's Leviticus 19 and 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the, I am the Lord. There you go. And uh, that word neighbor, which he tried to say, thou shalt love thy, uh, he, said, he says limited to somebody who's in close proximity uh, is limited to those of the same religion. Okay. Which he, he kind of understood is talking about um, the people like you. He's talking about your brother, the brethren of your nation, right? Your fellow citizen, like it says here, you know, friend, friend goes back to free or, or sometimes they say friar, friar, brother. He's talking about your brother. So your, your companion, your brother, your brother, your neighbor. So, you know, you could be next door to an Edomite, and you don't have to like that, that, that fucking Edomite, because he's not your brother. You could be next door to a damn uh, Elamite, I said like that. Ishmaelite, you don't have to like them, you know. Of course, uh, you want to try to be peaceful with all men, but hey, these, these, these Edomites, basically, they, they kind of understood that, and that's why they, they use that uh, for themselves. And they, which we wrote that anyway, you know, the Israelites, we, we wrote this information which Yahweh Shinabashai gave to us because he, he dealt with us and only us. And the scriptures tell you that multiple times as limited, right? To, so anyway, they, they figured themselves as the new children of Israel. The providential ex exceptionalism of his opponents to Edward's way of thinking gave license to God's people to behave any way they wanted towards people of other nations and ab abrogated the moral law that believers, especially with the coming of Christ, were universally ab obliged to obey. <laughs> so basically, they could do, you know, the Christians amongst each other, they loved each other, but they could do whatever they wanted to to the other nations, basically, which that's not even correct. Um, even for us, the Israelites, the people who the Bible is about, you still have there are certain things that you still enforce uh, when you're ruling over the other nations and you do not abuse. And Esau did not do that. And this this shows that basically, you know, for them, it was anything goes. They could they could, you know, you can't commit adultery even if it's a heathen woman. You still can't do it. You still can't do it. So certain things. Uh, Certain, certain laws do apply for the other nations as well, the so-called Goyim, and these Edomites, man, basically, they just did whatever they wanted to do and tried to pretend like they were the people of God to justify it. That's exactly what was going on. Whereas the men of the Lord today, we don't do that. We don't we do not do anything like that. We're, we, we hold ourselves accountable for everything that we do. But uh, to continue... To continue on, what was that? Right, for Edwards, this was a blasphemous way of talking. God may have given permission to the ancient Israelites. Um, to borrow from the Egyptians as a punishment for Egypt's sins, but this could not be made into an established rule in all cases. A special precept for a particular act, Edwards asserted, is not a rule. Citing the Apostle Paul, Edwards stated that God winked at the ignorance of believers in those times of darkness. But under the gospel, God didn't don't wink at such things now. Furthermore, in his notes, Edwards mentioned the glorious times when the church would enjoy an extended period of peace and prosperity before the last judgment. Now, just to skip over, uh, because basically, you know, these Edomites, at this point, all of them, damn near all of them have slaves, but they're, they're kind of arguing over, uh, you know, what, what God really wanted them to do, 
who's right, this and that, you know, the, trying to agree upon doctrine. This is what this guy Jonathan Edwards said. He said, uh, hold up, this is uh, an opponent of his, uh, Doolittle, Doolittle's critics apparently repeated claims that the revival was marked the beginning of these glorious times as an argument that slave owning was no longer tolerable. Edwards more realistically had to allow that these things were not yet settled in peace. So And so the fallen world order for him included slavery was still in effect. And there you go. So he, his, his family actually owned slaves, bottom line, that's a fact. All the same, he anticipated a time when many of the Negroes and Indians will be divines and excellent books will be published in Africa, in Ethiopia, in Turkey. So this guy, he's a, he's a devil. He's a devil. And he probably he probably knew that we were the Israelites. Some of these people actually kind of kind of figured it, but they couldn't say it. But uh, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna skip through some more because these devils, man, they have a lot to pay for. You know, it's you can't. All of this stuff is 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 written and recorded. You know, hey. What's done has been done. The water Yahweh Shimmy Shah for lightning the load of us. Now here's uh here's them handling, you know, one of our, our so called women. Uh, excuse me, one of so called African woman. That's what I mean to say, Salaki. So called African woman, which we know, you know, she's a she's he's talking about she's so called African American, so called black, whatever, whatever. Many, many by words for us. But uh, it says this woman had for some reason been a slave and had now obtained her freedom was married to a freeman of her own nation who was apparently pious. They had children, but their children went after another was soon taken from them by death. At the funeral of the last, uh, which I attended, she, she appeared, appeared deeply afflicted. Uh, so basically these Edomites, you know, were feeling her out to try to see if they could mentally you know, indoctrinated with this Christian bullshit, which they, they're going to go ahead and do with this hope. I soon visited her again, but discovered nothing beside the strong works in, workings of maternal affection. Not long after this, she came to see me and proposed to be baptized and to join the church. Oh, shit. After conversing freely with her upon the nature, importance, and the solemn, the solemn, solemn, solemnity it's a tongue towards this solemn solemnity of the public profession of religion. I dismissed her without giving a decided answer to her proposal, but told her I would take opportunity for further conversion conversation with her upon the subject. Accordingly, I soon visited her again and after conversing freely for some time, concluded that myself what the motives were which induced her to, to wish to be baptized and to become a member of the church. So basically, they're, they're considering it, but, you know, she's a, she's a nigga, you know, because if he was a real man of the Lord, seeing her waking up, he should be excited. But, you know, this is a, this is a damn nigga, a slave, you know, we'll think about it, you know, we'll think about it, the Lord is really dealing with you. These people playing games. They're playing games. And one guy kind of talked about well maybe in the future we'll let them in the church and and so they try to make this guy like he's a, a, a good guy or something. No, all he did was try to um, predict the, the progressiveness of the church. Yeah, because you have you have certain Edomites who are abolitionists, but they were only doing that to uh, undermine the uh, economy of the South. They hated black people just as much as the people in the South. But they wanted them to come up to the north and work in those damn uh, death trap factories where, you know, you could you could lose an arm, lose a hand, lose a limb, and there was no insurance or anything like that. So they re really didn't have to do anything for you. And uh, that's what they talk about Harriet Tubman. The elders uh, always talk about, you know, that's that's a that's probably where a lot a lot of that stuff came from, bringing bringing slaves up north. Because it just wasn't just sweet. Racism, you know, you even today, you go to the north, you go to the cities in the north, uh, 
so-called the Northeast Pennsylvania. You go to New York, right? You go to Philly, you go to Boston. Edomites just as racist as the fucking Edomites in Missouri and Texas and damn Mississippi. They, they all the same. They all the devil. But uh, just finishing out on this story. It says, I then told her that she found the God of heaven had a controversy with her. But on some account, it must be that he was angry with her for though he gave her children, yet he would not suffer them to live. That the strokes were repeated one after another and what evil would come next, she knew not. That she felt there could be no living for her soul. Something must be done in some way or another to heal this awful controversy and that she felt a hope that if she should be baptized and join the church this might in some measure heal the controversy and avert future evils and she at once acknowledged with great frankness that I had stated her case truly on this I represented to her the great evil of a hypocritical profession and the folly and wickedness of taking such measures to heal a controversy with the great and holy God, while she withheld her heart and refused to comply with those terms, upon which the divine mercy and favor were freely offered to her. She appeared affected, and I left her. Yeah, and then uh, jumping down, so eventually uh, they have another conversation. Such poor creature as I exclaimed again and again, join church. Such vile creature as I baptized. Such poor vile wretch coming to church. And this man, she spent perhaps half an hour with me, right? She was catching the Holy Spirit just like these damn Israelite women do today in the church. Seeing the uncommon agitation and agony of her mind, I conversed as well as I was capable with her for some time, rejoicing in the hope that divine truth had made its way to her conscience. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, you can read on in the story, but, uh, you know, basically, man, this dude is, he, he's uh, making fun of her, you know, the way she's talking, you know, it highlights I sleep a little while, then I wake up and see twas quite light. I scared. I jump right, you know, it's just, it's just more babble. Babble talking, you know, basically him disrespecting this woman. And, hey, that's why the, the scriptures talk about, you know, these Edomites, the, uh, these Edomites looked upon our shame. Matter of fact, I mean, okay, and it's Obadiah 1 and 12. They say what? But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou spoken proudly in the day of distress. Because that's what these Edomites, and, and that's exactly what he did. He's speaking proudly against this woman, this so-called African woman, which we know she's an Israelite. And, uh, you know, Obadiah, man, everything in, is here in Obadiah. It's talking about the pride of Esau, right? It's talking about how they're going to get burnt up, how they looked upon their brother. Who's the brother of Esau? It's Jacob. So we know in the end times, it's going to be it's going to be Jacob and Esau against each other. Okay? And this, man, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, man, because you Edomites, you, the, the, the Edomites, I, I'll say it like that, you, you can't get away. There's no getting away from this. Then, it's, then it talks about what? The Lord is near upon all the heathen. As as thou hast done, it shall be done to thee. Thy reward shall be upon thy head. It talks about, all in one 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 uh, chapter. It talks about Esau. It talks about looking upon their brother in the day of shame. It talks about Jacob shall be a fire and Joseph a flame. And Esau for stubble. It talks about his destruction. Everything is here. So, you know, you eat a much, you, you can't. You can't uh, you can't get away with it. You can't get away from it. And uh, this dude, 
you know, he made this into a, a, a damn mockery section. Because you got this woman up here, you know, she's lost her kids. She's under the curses, under the Bible, and he's just mocking her. Well, you know, maybe we'll allow you to join the church. You are a nigga. And, that, and that's, that's, that's all you Edomites to a core. Okay, because if you go out and you just go to a random church full of white people, they're going to treat you like a nigga in that church too. Okay, they're not going to talk to you with respect and then like that. They're going to talk to you like a slave. And that's that's point blank, bottom line. That's why you don't see, uh, you go to certain churches, certain so-called white churches, you're not going to see any black people. You're just not. And, and if you do, it's a coon. Most, most and entirely likely, it's going to be a coon. So, hey, with that being said, man, all praise to you. How I was shy. These Calvinists, these Christians, theologists are being, um, they're, they're, they're being exposed. That the doctrine is being exposed. It's been off for years and years. And the Lord has given us the sword, to the, the spiritual sword, I said like that, to use against them. And, and here we are. So I, I know I jumped around a little bit. Hopefully that was edifying. Shall